Hello, this is Ithaca Democratic Socialists of America Presents. I'm David Foote, an activist and organizer with the local DSI chapter, and we're joined today by Aurora Roger, who teaches history at Lehman Alternative Community School, is the Ithaca Teachers Association building representative there, as well as serving as chair of the Ithaca chapter of the DSA. Aurora, thank you for joining us. My pleasure, David. Thanks for having me. So we're here today to talk about schools. Um, I'm neither a parent nor a teacher, but speaking as someone from the outside, it seems that Ithaca and Tompkins County have had some significant challenges in determining how to safely operate schools during the pandemic. I saw that schools were closed in April of last year, about a year ago. Um, they reopened last summer in a way that seemed to be kind of at odds with what the community had planned for. There was a delayed reopening followed by a hybrid approach that included both online and in-person classes. And I see that there are now negotiations around allowing more elementary school students into their buildings. I'm sure this has been common for school districts across the US, but it certainly reflects the instability and the uncertainty that we're all living through. What has this been like for you and your colleagues as educators? Well, um, in Ithaca and I think around the country, it's been the hardest year ever to be a teacher. I mean, we as teachers are planners. We like to plan out our entire year, what we're gonna be learning when, uh, and not only can we not plan, you know, for what's gonna happen in our classroom because one technical difficulty can ruin everything, but we can't plan, you know, days in advance, weeks in advance because we might be shut down, we might be reopening. Um, so it's, yeah, it's been a real roller coaster. And um, I teach secondary school, so middle and high school. And we are doing a hybrid approach where I have students who are in person at the same time as students who are online. So I'm teaching online and in person at the same time, which is incredibly challenging, often fails, um, really frustrating for everyone involved. And um, this is something that a lot of teachers did not want to do and uh, the district went forward with it without, uh, went forward with it anyway. And that, that's been really uh, a struggle and we're hoping that's gonna change. The elementary schools are split. So there are online classes and there's in-person classes, which has its own struggles also. What is it like interacting with students when you have both on the screen and in the classroom? It's, it's tough. I'm generally sitting like in front of my computer and I have uh, the district got us these devices. They're called owls that have like a rotating camera and microphone and speaker. So they kind of pick up the, the kids in the classroom, but I generally have to repeat anything that a kid says in the classroom. I just repeat for the online students. So I'm kind of like a parrot. Um, and then the kids at home who are online, you know, it often feels like I'm either talking with one group or the other. It's almost impossible to feel like we're all one classroom community, which is really uh, frustrating. So we've got owls and parrots both in the classroom. Then. <laughs> yes, a lot of birds. Well, of course, as you've hinted at, teaching is an incredibly important vocation. You're guiding and supporting the next generation of community members. I know it involves a lot of invisible work, things that you do outside of the classroom and in. Um, that people aren't aware of, but and 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 thus maybe don't fully appreciate. At the same time, I know teaching is one of the last vocations that has a lot of consistent unions, some very strong radical unions. As we saw over the last several years, there have been major labor actions by teachers in West Virginia, Oklahoma, Arizona, and more. Um, as someone who serves in your union. Um, as well as chairperson of the DSA chapter. How's this time been from an organizing standpoint? Um, it's a great question. You know, the teachers, um, radical teachers across the country, so starting in Chicago in 2012 and, um, and then West Virginia, Oklahoma, like you mentioned, I think a lot of those teachers, uh, uh, you know, we say, 
that student learning conditions are teacher working conditions. So um, their learning conditions and working conditions, I think were significantly worse than say a district like Ithaca, which is fairly well resourced. Um, our buildings are not crumbling for the most part. We don't have police in schools. So um, as someone who wants to be organizing um, always, that's why I'm with the DSA, I was kind of frustrated. I'm like, wow, things are just like a little too good to get people invested in, um, in the union in fighting for, um, fighting as a union. And I think, you know, unfortunately with all of the terribleness of COVID, it has really uh, reinvigorated our union to an extent where people are interested now in, in their workplace organizing because they have to be because everyone's life has been so terribly impacted by our worsened uh, working conditions, which are of course worsened uh, learning conditions. And I think that that's really important to recognize that when teachers talk about how miserable it is to be teaching two groups of students at once, it's miserable for us because we recognize that it's not best for our students. And that's, um, ju it's just really hard when you just want what's best for your students and it's impossible to give them right now. And so from an organizing standpoint, it's been really, um, that part has been kind of exciting. I've definitely been working more with my um, coworkers to, um, you know, fight for what we think will be best, what will be most safe. Um, and, and then we've also, of course, uh, done a lot of work in the DSA chapter around um, local issues. And I think, you know, there's like the twin crises right now of police violence and COVID. And I think we've been trying to work on both. So it's been, it's been a crazy year. It's crazy to think how much organizing we've been doing without being uh, in the same room as one another. <laughs> I don't even know what organizing uh, looks like in person anymore. Yeah, I've had similar sentiments pop up for myself, thinking about how, how everyone has become accustomed to the facilitation of online meetings and how you sort of get in line to make a comment next, um, which we never did before. We had to have someone scanning the room, watching for raised hands, trying to discourage people from interrupting each other. So figuring out how to translate the organizing we've been doing now for over a year um, back in, in the future when we're able to get together again will be a whole nother thing to figure out. Totally. I wanted to ask, um, I've never been part of a union myself, but I, I certainly value the, move, the role the labor movement has played in um, giving people a voice in their workplace. Can you talk a little bit more to the extent that you're able about the way the local te teachers union has operated? Um, what role did they play in decision making over the past year? And uh, what voice do teachers have through their union? Um, yeah, so our union uh, is our union president and to an extent other elected leaders in the union are present at most decision making tables. Uh, I think the power, and that's powerful, of course, and they're there to represent our interests. Um, I am interested in our union um, playing an even larger role in the future, perhaps. I think we could, we could really, um, because teacher unions, you know, we, um, with the Taylor Law, like we're not allowed to strike. We are not allowed to do a lot of um, more radical actions that are where workers really show their power um, by stopping work. So uh, I think that that has led to some like bureaucratic um, union as a component of management, um, labor relations as opposed to labor struggles. And I think, um, I think we have room to grow there as a union and I'm excited about that. And I think others in my union are, are excited about that as well. But uh, I definitely am really grateful that we have been at the negotiating table and that there is someone speaking for us in all of these decisions um, that are being made. So yeah, a union way better than no union and all unions can uh, be more powerful and more effective through workplace organizing. That's certainly an excellent point. Um, many, one, another thing that I'd been thinking about as, as I thought about how this conversation might go, 
Uh, most of us who have been paying attention to political issues are aware of the many converging crises that this pandemic made worse. Our hospitals were already underfunded and understaffed alongside of very ghastly profiteering off of uh, tr the treatment of people who are sick or injured. The precarity of housing and employment in this country, which existed before 2020. And this class of folks who we now call essential workers being paid way less than a minimum wage across the country, even here in, in relatively well off Tompkins County. Um, I don't think many of us are especially optimistic that this pandemic, this economic and health crisis has, will result in a lot of lessons being learned, that things will improve just because of how heightened these divides have become, how stark the disparity is um, between outcomes for people in this country. But if we were able to dream big, and I know that's what we're always doing as socialists, if we could make our, our own wish list, what do you think we should have learned about how to improve our education system? Well, I think a lot of the issues that you mentioned are issues that impact the education system. You know, there's um, a lot of people talk about the achievement gap as this um, big disparity in standardized test scores um, between um, students of color, especially black students and white students. And um, there are other scholars who say that we should really be thinking of this as an opportunity gap and that it's really never, we're never going to be able to um, have all of our students performing um, and learning at the same capacity when they don't have food on the table, when they don't have stable housing, um, when their parents are uh, working constantly and don't have time to, you know, be around them, right? It's like, it's not that their parents don't care about them, they care about them, but they're working three jobs. And so they have no time to read to them to help them with their homework, etc. So I think that um, democratic socialist changes to society would have a huge impact on um, our students success and our students ability to learn. Um, that being said, say we get all those things, that wouldn't be enough, right? We also within education, I think we need to just abandon this standardized testing ridiculousness that we've been, um, you know, beating ourselves with for the past, I don't know, since was 2003, um, No Child Left Behind. It's like, it, it hasn't worked. The achievement gap hasn't closed just because we measure it more. Um, and, you know, the, this year, actually, there's, there's a huge, there was a big discourse. Last year, standardized tests got canceled. Turned out everybody was fine. <laughs> I mean, everybody wasn't fine because there was COVID, but this, the lack of standardized testing didn't do anything bad, right? This year, um, there was a huge push. And in fact, in New York State, uh, the New York State Board of Regents requested that we not have standardized tests. And um, the federal government, Joe Biden, um, said, no, we do need to have standardized tests this year. So we're actually administering standardized tests starting on Monday, um, which is ridiculous that we would... I mean, like, what kind of data could you possibly be gathering? We're going to have like four different cohorts, you know, because I see half my students, I see a quarter of my students every day, because half of them are online all the time, and a quarter of them come half the week, and a quarter, it's like the biggest, most ridiculous headache, it's going to ruin the entire week of school, we're not going to learn any useful information from it, um, and I feel like the way that we could just cancel tests last year made it really obvious, like, oh, we don't need these, we Teachers know what students need to know. And it, this, the tests give us no useful information. They're a huge waste of time, huge waste of money, huge waste of resources. Um, in other schools, my school, I'm very fortunate to teach an alternative school, but at schools that um, are not alternative and that's in school districts where test scores are tied to things like funding and whether a school could even remain open. I mean, these high stakes tests ruin the joy of learning. They force students into, um, they force teachers to teach the test. They force students into conformity. Um, and the testing companies are making, you know, billions. So doing away with standardized testing um, is huge for me. I think another huge thing for an educational wish list is, um, like I said, I teach at an alternative school where um, teachers have a lot of autonomy. I get to make up my own classes. Students get to choose what classes they wanna take. We have a lot of mixed grade level classes um, and a lot of elective things that are, you know, supposedly non-academic. Like normally we have week long um, trips 
every spring and we um, all students are part of committees, which are like clubs that help run the school. So I think um, sort of bringing into school non-academic things, fun things that get, ex get students excited about community, excited about um, the world around them is, is really essential and giving autonomy to teachers and students to um, figure out what's best for their school community. That's my wish list. That's great. It, it's something that I think I wouldn't have thought of otherwise, but very good point you made about um, what if we know that learning has become very difficult at this time and, and student development very difficult, then testing that is only going to lead to some 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 tough data that we're collecting on it. Um, but we're looking at a bright future, ending isolation, bringing people back together. I think most of us are pretty ready to feel like things are, are going to be normal again. And to some extent, I think that we are on track. Um, I was not optimistic myself at the beginning of this year, but seeing more people get vaccinated um, and even being able to access it myself has been somewhat reassuring. I saw that more than half the people in Tompkins County have now received at least their first vaccination. Is the school district uh, planning for this next phase of life, whatever we're calling normal? Are schools playing a role in providing resources and outreach to families? Um, yeah, I mean, so we, I think that the Ithaca schools have actually done a really great job providing resources to families throughout the pandemic. In the early stages of the pandemic, one of the one of the things I was most proud of as a member of the district was um, the way that we continued food deliveries because a lot of our students rely on our um, free breakfast and lunch programs. And um, yeah, so we continued to employ our bus drivers to deliver food to uh, students when the schools were shut down. And I think that, and we also had um, like food hub pickups at certain schools, including my school. So I think Throughout the pandemic, um, we have been trying to kind of model the community school um, model. And uh, yeah, the my, my school, Lehman Alternative Community School was a vaccine uh, clinic. There's a vaccine clinic pop up there on Saturday. Um, and there's gonna be another for um, West Hill. We're on West Hill where there's a lot of uh, low income housing. So in that way, yes, we're doing outreach, providing resources. Um, I th you know, there's always more that we could do, but we, um, I think teachers, all my teacher friends, coworkers, we were all very excited to be in uh, phase whatever, 1B and be able to get our vaccines. Um, so I got mine starting in February, which was great. And it has definitely made going into work feel um, safer and more comfortable, less anxiety producing. So yeah, and, and the CDC just changed their guidelines from six feet of distance in classrooms to three feet. Um, and so our, our district is making changes there now and trying to bring more students into the classroom, which has its pluses and minuses. Um, mm -hmm. But that's, that's one of the things they're doing. We, there's been like no real information about the next phase of um, like next year, what next year is gonna look like. You know, we have the summer as a buffer, but um, I know a lot of my coworkers and myself were very eager to uh, make sure that we don't have to do this hybrid model in this way for another year because our heads will explode. Um, but I will say one really exciting piece of news that I just got today is that because the CDC changed their guidelines for um, outdoor gatherings, there you can now have outdoor gatherings of up to 200 people. So I think we are going to be doing in-person um, graduation ceremonies, which is, a really important part of um, our kind of school traditions and was like a one of the many tragic losses of last year was that we had to do like online graduation. So that's something that I'm, I'm really excited about. And I feel like those moments will be so much sweeter knowing that, um, you know, having to wait so long for them. Yeah, graduation without sharing that time with your fellow students you only get the boring parts then. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you mentioned the the bus drivers delivering food. Mm -hmm. um, that ends at something else I wanted to talk a little bit about, which is the fact that even through these, these really dark times over the past year, we've seen a prolif proliferation of mutual aid networks, people supporting each other, sharing with each other, finding new ways to connect in really creative ways. 
And I know it's a central belief of socialist and even anarchist ideology that cooperation and community are stronger than anything we're organizing against. So I wondered if you have any stories or anecdotes you might be able to share that really made you feel like things were going to be okay. Um, well, I guess uh, one of the things, one of the worst parts and best parts of teaching is that when things happen, students want to process them and it's often in their history classes where they feel like they're going to process the current events that are happening and there's just been so many things i mean january 6th and um george floyd's murder and uh dante wright's murder and i mean uh i'm forgetting the 13 year old child that was murdered this week by police um so these things processing them in my classroom is really painful um but I also, I feel like I can see the country's discourse shifting like in my classroom. So like two years ago, talking about police murder, it was like body cams, body cams, body cams. And now it's like defund the police, defund the police, abolish the police. And um, it's not coming from me. I'm not giving it to them. <laughs> They're bringing it to the classroom. Um, so I think just like seeing the uh, radical visionary imagination and drive and like the kids know that this world is unsustainable, uh, racist, unfair, and they are like, there's, we just have to scrap it and start over. And I think that that's really cool. And those conversations, um, definitely make me feel good make me feel like you know the youth the youth uh know what's up so even in your workplace you can't get away from radicals <laughs> no i'm dogged by them they won't <laughs> stop taking my classes <laughs> we do have a couple of uh extra minutes aurora um i wondered if we could turn from the schools to talk a little bit about the work that dsa is doing here in ithaca um could you just outline a few of the projects that the local organization has taken on this year? Sure. Um, well, one of the um, really exciting things um, that we've been doing is we've been um, organizing to try and get the city of Ithaca to opt into the Emergency Tenants Protection Act, um, which is a statewide um, piece of legislation that municipalities have to um, opt into that would provide rent stabilization, which is kind of like rent control, not quite as good, but kind of like rent control. And we suspect it would be for about 25% of Ithaca's um, rental units, which is like a very long explanation, but basically 25% of Ithaca would basically have rent control. It would be awesome. And um, we've been making phone calls, knocking doors, distributing literature. Uh, we have a petition with, I think around 600 signatures at this point and still, still growing. So What's really exciting is that um, next week, the um, first step to opting in is to commission a vacancy study to say that like, yes, we're eligible to opt in. Um, and that um, commissioning of the vacancy study is gonna come up for a vote in um, the planning and economic development uh, committee of common council. So a lot of words to say there's movement on opting into ETPA. And I think that that could be really awesome. And I think, I mean, part of, what has made ETPA possible um, and this movement for ETPA is the incredible growth um, in the Ithaca Tenants Union, which uh, is, I mean, just absolutely blossomed uh, during COVID. And that's something that's really exciting that DSA has been involved with, but definitely not in charge of, or, um, you know, that's a, it's an autonomous organization, but something that also brings me a lot of joy. Um, yeah, we've got an eco-socialist working group that also came into existence during COVID that is um, part of a statewide coalition for public power um, and also organizing um, against NYSEG, uh, utilities, cutoffs, um, all sorts of really interesting stuff. We have been part of an anti-racist coalition fighting to um, defund IPD, uh, the Ithaca Police Department. That's its own can of worms because uh, <laughs> that's, this is a whole nother radio show, what's going on there. But we have definitely been instrumental there. Um, and 
yeah, I'm sure I'm, I'm missing things. Ithaca DSA has, um, so uh, another thing that Ithaca DSA um, works on is um, we have this radio show and TV that you are watching or listening to right now. Um, we also have a um, ongoing series of what we are calling our socialist night schools that happen monthly. Um, we have speakers, generally very brief speakers. We um, have some readings and then we have really awesome discussions about um, different topics. They're all different topics. You don't have to go to one to go to the next. Um, they're very free open discussion. So it, we, we've been getting around 40 people at those events. They happen on Zoom and they have been really lovely. And I think a lot of people have appreciated just kind of the like community coming together to have these um, discussions. And I know I've learned a lot through them. We are also starting a Marxist reading group um, that will be more of like a long-term commitment. Um, I think they're gonna meet every other week. And yeah, that's, that's coming soon in May starting with the Communist Manifesto. I think the pandemic has pushed a lot of people to um, a breaking point where they realize I have to do something. And I think that we have become one of the places where people feel that they can do something. And we welcome that and we want that. And yeah, let's do something together. I couldn't agree more. So this has been Ithaca DSA Presents. I'm your host, David Foote activist and organizer with the Democratic Socialists of America, joined by Aurora Roger, a history teacher at Lehman Alternatives Community School and chair of our chapter. If you'd like to learn more, you can find us at IthacaDSA.org or search on Facebook or Instagram for Ithaca DSA. I believe we have the, the simple name parked in both of those locations. Thank you again, Aurora, for joining us. Thank you, David. One, two, one, two, three.